We are moving now on. We have afterwards a half an hour of questions and answers for the whole panel. And uh, now I would like to announce uh, uh, Dr. Ricardo Panicucci, Global Head of Chemical Profiling and uh, at the Novartis Institute of, for Biomedical Research in Cambridge in the US. Uh, to talk about the search for the magic, uh, magic bullet. Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of the meetings for the kind invitation to having, you, having me speak to you today. Um, it's really an honor and a privilege to be here as well. So I'm going to try to play the devil's advocate and, and try to uh, by asking some questions. And one of the questions is, are we, as, an, as a community, really trying to, are we really solving the problems we need to solve? in order to realize the full potential of nanotechnology. And uh, from my view and a big pharma view, uh, it's probably not. We're probably not doing everything we need to do. And um, so that's my short answer. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of uh, drug targeting and nanotechnology, but there's still some fundamental questions like, biodistribution, uh, tumor uh, penetration, and toxicity that we still need to answer. And I, I'm sure together we'll be able to answer those um, uh, issues. Uh, so um, part of my talk is going to be just sharing that Novartis experience with you, and maybe you can better understand uh, why I answered that way. So to start, um, there's a recent article by Tom McKay who basically highlights the promise of uh, nanotechnology. In that article, as you can see, um, there's opportunity with almost every single part of the body. Everything from making your eyesight better to making, your, to making you look younger by uh, treating your skin to having sensors and devices that will detect disease to obviously drug targeting as well. I just took a few quotes from this article uh, just to highlight just how positive uh, things could be. Nanotechnology could change human biology forever. I believe that. Uh, the possibilities are endless. So I probably believe that as well. The ultimate dream of every healer, medicine man, physician throughout recorded history will at last become a reality. Uh, I'm interested to hear what the medicine man has to say about that. <laughs> and lastly, maybe not so, uh, um, not so overwhelmingly positive, but uh, nanotechnology could be the future of medicine. I think, uh, I think we could probably, he could probably use words that are a lot stronger than that. So focusing uh, more on drug targeting and nanotechnology, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. We've seen ver uh, several versions of this, but the idea, of course, is Instead of uh, delivering drug to the entire body, we want to target to a specific uh, tissue. In most cases, in oncology, it's a tumor. Someone else presented this very nicely today, increasing efficacy, reducing side effects. And the main uh, vehicles will be through either passive or active targeting. So that's, uh, that's uh, something that Novartis is very interested in as well. Uh, it sounds easy. It has not been so easy. Uh, I can speak to that um, yeah, from my own experience. So uh, there are several articles now. I just hi I'm highlighting two here, or three, I should say, uh, that uh, the first two bullets basically are saying that we've spent a lot of time on uh, establishing a certain um, uh, technology. Now we kind of need to uh, move on from that. And then the third bullet, it's more around that we fundamentally need to look at solving this problem differently. So uh, the most telling in, a, in the recent one is, however, after 30 years, billions of dollars and countless research hours, EPR-based cancer therapeutics have left us only a marginally better position than we would have had been without. I'm assuming this person's not at this conference. <laughs> But maybe, maybe he is, I don't know. Um, but uh, I think I'm a little more optimistic than that, but I just wanted to highlight that there are some other views out there that we should pay attention to. 
At Novartis, we see drug targeting basically in three different uh, categories. One that's device enabled, so for us this means these microcatheters that are getting smaller and smaller, uh, that deliver drugs uh, very effectively, uh, especially for brain delivery. I mean, there aren't that many options. Um, nanotechnology, we've heard a whole week's worth of talks on that. And thirdly, uh, uh, drug conjugates. This is primarily the antibody drug conjugates. Uh, but however, I'm going to be talking about our experience with uh, nanotechnologies more specifically. So I'm going to show two examples. One uh, where we looked at, uh, actually, you know, we looked, overall we looked at a lot of different um, types of technologies. Uh, I want to say at least a dozen in this nanoparticle um, area where we're able to encapsulate drug within a nanoparticle using a lot of different polymers and um, uh, things like that. So my cells, I mean, we've looked at a lot of different approaches. And then I want to show you one example where we looked at um, direct conjugation with polymers. So this is where, obviously, we have a polymer that self-assembles, and to that we conjugate a drug and then deliver it that way. So uh, this is just some sampling of some data, um, but really I could have showed uh, any any of the various technologies that we have studied. And I think both of these case studies I'm going to show are pretty representative of what our experience has been. So in uh, what we found was that um, uh, tumor tar, especially um, uh, targeting with ligands in vitro look pretty good. I think I've seen several presentations this week that kind of mimic this slide where you know, you look at the free drug and you compare that with, uh, uh, in this case, nanoparticles that had uh, ligands on them. Sure enough, the toxicity, or I should say the efficacy goes up, and even it had a modifying effect of the uh, IC50 in this case for this particular drug. However, it's been our experience, uh, and so, sorry, before I go into the actual in vivo data, uh, oh, this is in vivo data, but uh, the PK data. And most of the time, we're able to dramatically increase the um, uh, PK properties of almost any drug and almost in every technology that we studied. So uh, you've seen a lot of examples of this as well. However, this is the typical data we saw uh, uh, in uh, tumor studies where once again, uh, we're looking at the mean tumor volume as a function of time and injections. And in this particular case, the free drug, which is in orange, is embedded with all the other nanotechnologies. So this was a, a little bit disappointing to us because these are the same ones that showed um, targeting in, in vitro, right? But I think um, more concerning is the overall toxicity. And uh, once we looked at the mean body weight uh, as a function of time, you see the once again the orange uh, um, the orange data that's the free drug, and these are the targeted supposedly targeted uh, formulations. So we've seen this over and over and over uh, in many examples, uh, and so I think one of the major things that's stopping us is uh, you know this kind of uh, toxicity or at least a surrogate for toxicity the the loss in weight. Uh, in, in animals. And hopefully someone out there has some answers uh, for this. Uh, second example is with uh, polymer drug conjugates. And uh, so this is just uh, PK uh, data that basically, in this case, we had three different formulations compared to the free drug. And uh, what, the, what differentiated the three formulations is the ligand that the molecule was attached to uh, and these were basically, um, uh, they were, uh, one was more liable than, the, uh, liable than the other. So we saw uh, a drug release that was differentiated by the ligand. So once again, uh, PK was, um, was enhanced uh, using the nanoparticle. And even when you looked at tumor PK, it really correlated very nicely with the ligands that we were using. So this, um, this red trace here that showed prolonged tumor exposure, this was the one where uh, they had the slowest release in the ligand, 
and then these other, the blue and the green were then uh, faster releases. However, even with this, and you see we got substantial tumor concentrations for long periods of time. Even this particular study did not show any increased efficacy over the free drug alone. So it left us with our heads, scratching our heads, trying to figure out what's going on here. So um, uh, after, and especially in big pharma, I mean, we want, we want to be able to take technologies and plug them in to our pipeline. So after we do, I would say, a dozen or more of these sort of experiments, we start to really maybe, I wouldn't say lose interest, but it becomes more and more difficult to sell the idea um, you know, to project teams that are looking for these kind of solutions. So what should we do? I mean, I've put up three examples. I don't know if these are the answers, but at least there, there are some different thinking uh, involved here that we're interested in trying. There's some indication that um, size and shape obviously plays a dramatic role. Um, we've worked closely with the guys at Liquidia to, to test this, and um, also Joe DeSimone at UNC has uh, proposed that basically you can uh, further help the accumulation of particles by changing the size and shape. Not so easy unless you have this sort of print technology to do, uh, to, to, to make these particles, but uh, we've seen some encouraging uh, results with this. Or maybe a completely different approach um, is some of the work of um, Janeski at, uh, in San Diego. He's suggesting that we should completely change the format and use these kind of long circulating rods. Um, and then once they get to the right place, uh, they could be triggered by certain enzymes to produce these very small nanoparticles. So once again, I mean, it's, um, it's maybe um, a better mousetrap, but uh, uh, he's shown very nicely that this works um, in a lot of different examples. And then maybe lastly, just completely different, uh, instead of um, injecting particles into the systemic circulation, Maybe a different approach that, um, that Paula Hammond is working on is this layer by layer approach where there's an initial substrate that is probably you can inject next to the tumor and to that is then applied layers of uh, positively and negatively charged uh, 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 materials that then can be injected and then released in the area, a more specific area. Uh, so. I mean, that's one approach that we're currently pursuing as well. So just to conclude, I think um, uh, this, whole area, uh, this whole area of research needs to be a little bit more like the Wright, like the Wright brothers. Uh, and their philosophy was on the same day that the New York Times uh, wrote an article that man would never fly, they were assembling their first aircraft. So hopefully, uh, I still have this attitude about, the, about nanotechnology, and I hope uh, after this meeting you do as well. Thank you. Thank you very much.